I would bet probably today you're going to have some traditions that you take part in, maybe because of Mother's Day. But if you don't have any today, that's not the end of the world. I'm sure there's an event or a holiday uh, each year that you uh, do something traditionally with your family. And that's totally great. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, when I was growing up back in North Carolina, I grew up in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Uh, most of our family uh, lived close to one another. Uh, not like same street close, but like same city close, okay? Uh, all my aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, all that, they lived within about 15, 20 minutes of, of one another. And so uh, each Christmas, when Christmas rolled around, we had a tradition uh, for our family specifically. Uh, we would get up early at our house on Christmas morning and open presents and have breakfast together. And then we would get dressed and rush over to my grandma's house for lunch. And we would open presents there. And then about the time we felt settled in and comfortable and we were visiting with one another, we would pack up all of our stuff there and we'd rush over to my great-grandmother's house, okay, uh, for Christmas there. And then we'd meet all those, like, extended relatives that you don't really know that well and it was really awkward. Y'all ever have that happen at Christmas? Uh, I'm sure that you do. But here's the thing. On paper, it sounded like a great idea. And we really did this, like, every year that I lived at home as, as I was growing up. Um, it sounded great on paper to be able to visit with all that extended family on one day. But what ha often happened, and I'm sure you've experienced this, is we just felt really stressed and really rushed and really stretched thin because we were bouncing around so much to all these different houses. And on a day when we wanted to spend real quality time with our immediate family, we didn't get to. You see, the, the tradition really got in the way of what was really most important. You know with me? So today what we're going to look at in chapter 7 of John as we finish up this chapter, what we're going to see is tradition actually get in the way of some people believing in Jesus. Now, we've talked about tradition and religion throughout this, but today we're going to be very, very specific as we dive into the second half of chapter 7, okay? Now, if you're following along throughout our series, last week Pastor Chad did a great job of jumping into the beginning of chapter 8, okay? So we kind of went a little out of order, but we did it on purpose because I wanted to make sure that I was able to cover this second half well and connect it back to the message from two weeks ago. By the way, if you've not caught up for a while, or maybe you're just joining us, you're like, man, this is really good, you can jump on our YouTube channel and you can find all those past sermons. I would invite you to catch up in that way. But today what I want us to look at as we look at these folks that were, that were really latched on and really leaning into their tradition instead of trusting Jesus, I think if we'll look closely, there are some very practical things to challenge us today in a way in which I'm going to ask you really three questions today. And those questions, if you'll answer them honestly, will tell you today whether you have a true trust in Jesus Christ and you've placed your faith in him or whether you, all you have is tradition and religion like a lot of the people here in the story. Now, with that in mind, again, I want you to be honest with yourself today. Let's jump back in to John chapter 7. We're going to pick it up in verse 37. I'll read this for us. On the last and the greatest day of the festival, okay, remember this is the Feast of Booths or the, or the Festival of Tabernacles, depending on what translation that you have, Jesus stood up and he said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now, rewind back two weeks and remember the scene that I set up for you a couple weeks ago, okay? There are tens of thousands of Jewish people that have all gathered in Jerusalem and come from all over the place, traveled for miles and miles and miles, all to come together for the Feast of Booths or the Festival of Tabernacles. If you remember what we said uh, previously, everyone here is camping out. Remember, this is a giant camp out. They were out there in their makeshift tents, okay, for seven days to remember God's faithfulness in the past to their ancestors when the ancestors were wandering around in the wilderness following Moses, okay? If you know that story, that's what it's honoring, okay? And this tradition was one that they took part in every fall, um, right about the time of harvest, and this was four days after the Day of Atonement. Come back next week and we'll talk more about the Day of Atonement, okay? But according to Jewish history, listen closely, we know that each day of this festival of booze, the high priest would take a golden pitcher and walk down from the Temple Mount and down into the old city of Jerusalem, and he would fill the pitcher with water from a pool called the Pool of Siloam. Now, the Pool of Siloam was special, and it's important, and you can like, like blow right past this detail in the text if you're not careful, okay? But it adds a lot of significance to what Jesus just claimed. So the pool of Siloam was not just like a pool where you like let animals drink water and you drink water and whatever. It was a specific pool they used for ritual ceremonial cleansing, okay? Ritual ceremonial cleansing. And ritual cleansing, like what needed to take place in this context per the law of Moses, was that that pool had to be fed by living water. And he said, well, what do you mean living water? Well, they believed in, in what the law prescribed was that living water was water that had to come directly from God, okay? It was water that had to come down from the sky, rain. 
I know we don't know much about what rain is in this part of the country, but you, you kind of can imagine, you've seen it on TV before, okay? All right, rain was one piece of, of living water, right? Or it was from a natural spring in the earth, okay? The Pool of Siloam was fed from something called the Gihon Spring, okay? And it, so it was living water coming into this pool. And every day of the festival, the, the, the high priest would go down to this pool and it would dip his ladle in or his giant golden pitcher in and he would get living water out, okay? So keep that in mind as we keep walking through the story, okay? He would bring the water back to the altar of sacrifice there in the temple, and he would pour it out on the altar ceremonially. Then there would be three blasts of a trumpet. Uh, the trumpet was a thing called a shofar, okay? It looked like a giant ram's horn. You've probably seen something like that in a movie before, right? Okay? So shofar, show good, okay? <laughs> you laugh at the jokes, this will go a lot easier for you, okay? You just really will, Okay? There'd be three blasts of the trumpet after he, after he pours the water out, and then the people would cry out a text from Isaiah chapter 12. The prof, Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament. Isaiah 12, 3, they would all shout this together. They'd say, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And they would cheer, and they would sing, and they would dance, and they would celebrate how that God had provided water and rain for them over this past harvest that they're taking in. And they would pray that God would provide it again for the upcoming year. Okay, again, think agricultural culture here, much like our own here in southwest Kansas, okay? But the entire tradition of this festival was all about God's provision in the wilderness and specifically about the water that God provided for them. So this was a water festival, if you will, okay? Then on the last day, the last and greatest day, as John says it, of the festival would, would be the most popular event of this whole ritual ceremony. So the high priest would do what he did all six days leading up to that final day, okay? He would get the ladle, get the water in there, right? He would come back to uh, the altar of sacrifice, right? And, but when he got to the altar, what they would do is he, along with all the people, would parade around the altar seven times, okay? So it was like this, this big giant parade, the, 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 the high priest out there with his golden pitcher full of living water, right? And all these people following behind him, all ready to celebrate and celebrate God that provided for them when their ancestors were out in the wilderness. Now, you might be able to remember, if you've ever been to Sunday school, uh, marching around something seven times is significant too, isn't it? Remember the Battle of Jericho in the Old Testament? They marched around the, the city seven times and the, the walls crumbled, right? It was this, this whole ritual, this whole ceremony that was really well orchestrated was to remind them, again, the wilderness wanderings were over at Jericho because that was the first city that they, they would take over on their way into the Promised Land. So this is all about God's faithfulness, right? So they'd march around the altar seven times, following behind the high priest, okay? Very orchestrated. And then after this piece, everyone there knew you're supposed to be completely quiet after we walk around this thing seven times. And so there was this hush across the crowd. And then in complete silence, that high priest would take that pitcher of water and he would pour it out. And once he had finished pouring it out on that, on that last and final day, the people would shout again, with joy, right, that Isaiah passage, with joy you'll draw water from the wells of salvation. Now, John gives us a really great picture of the life of Jesus. And he tells us about this being the day when Jesus said what he just said about being living water. But as I was thinking about this, again, we're not given the exact timing in the day, but wouldn't it be just like Jesus to stand up right in the middle of that moment of silence and say what he said here? See, he, his timing was beautiful throughout this whole thing. We've heard him talk about and claim to be the, the bread of life when all these people are hungry looking for physical bread. And here, in the midst of this, this great celebration, this great tradition and ceremony, celebrating the living water, right, that comes out of that pool of Siloam. Wouldn't it be incredible if in that moment, in that pregnant pause, as everyone was hushed and quiet, Jesus stands up and he shouts at the top of his lungs and said, he yells in a loud voice, let all who are thirsty come to me and drink. He said, as the scripture says, I'm going to give you rivers of living water that will flow from within them. See, what a powerful moment here. What a powerful context for him to step up and claim another incredible claim. So he's offering them something really amazing here. He's telling them, listen, guys, I am the fulfillment of the ceremony that you guys just took part in. I am the reason. I'm what this festival is supposed to point you to. I am the true living water here to quench your thirst. But you see, many of the Israelites living in Jesus' day had forgotten the true purpose of those rituals and traditions. They just become a thing that they do once a year at this festival. They weren't thinking about how they were supposed to point to the Messiah, Jesus. 
And so Jesus stands up in their midst and yells out, I am the living water. Believe in me and rivers of living water will flow from within you. You'll have no need to go down to that pool of Siloam again. Now, sadly, we know the end of this story is that most of the people there that day refused to trust Jesus and instead clung to their traditions. But what I think Jesus says here in this, in this brief verse or two, it gives us some great indicators to know whether what you have today is tradition or a true trust in Jesus Christ. Like, I want you to be very honest with yourself today. I'm going to give you three questions, and I want you to answer them to yourself honestly. And depending on the way you answer these questions, it'll tell you really quickly whether what you have is a tradition and a religion and a ritual or what you have is a true, genuine trust in Jesus Christ, a belief unto faith, all right? So here's the first thing Jesus says, first of all. To obtain this living water, he says you have to be thirsty. Everyone say thirsty. See, you have to want something more than your tradition or whatever else you're looking to in this life to satisfy. And so that's our first question today. I want to ask you this. Have you ever been thirsty? If you're taking notes, write it down. Have you ever been thirsty? thirsty. And I'm not talking about a physical thirst. I'm talking about a spiritual thirst. Have you ever felt the need for something more in this life? That what you have is not enough. That you're missing something. That there is a void. Because until you have that thirst, you will never taste of the living water that Jesus is offering here. See, I I don't know about you. I don't really like to drink water personally. Um, I, my wife gets after me all the time. She's like, you need to drink more water. You need to drink more water. And she drinks like five gallons a day or something. She's like super healthy. And I'm over here like sipping on Coke. Like, hey, it's got carbonated water in it. You know, does that count? I'd much rather drink coffee. I'd much rather drink, you know, Coke or pop or whatever you want to call it, whatever you guys call it here, right? But here's the difference though for me. When I'm outside exercising or jogging or, or uh, working in the yard or something like that, moving things around in the yard, and I suck in some of that cursed Southwest Kansas dust you know what I'm talking about? We have experienced that over the past month, have we not, right? I know all of y'all have decided, y'all have thought about moving like 10 times in the past month. I get it, sucking that in. When I'm out there in that context, you know what? I don't need to be told to drink water. You realize that? I bet you're the same way. When you're out there and you really truly are thirsty, coffee does not sound good. Coke does not sound good. The only thing that sounds good is real, real cold glass of water, right? When you are truly thirsty, and when I'm truly thirsty out there in that context, it causes me to run to that water. You see, it's the same thing for us spiritually. When we sense that thirst, it ought to drive us to Jesus, the living water. And so has there been a point in your life when you were thirsty? Has there been a point in your life when you wanted something more? Listen, have have, have you ever realized, or maybe it's when you pillow your head at night and you're left just to your thoughts in the quiet, have you ever sensed that there is a void, there is something missing in your soul? Now, what I didn't say is have you ever, you know, gotten saved or gotten baptized to get a get out of jail free card or a get out of hell free card? Sadly, that's what I see so often in church. It's, oh, you know, my parents wanted me to get baptized. My parents wanted me to pray this prayer and accept Jesus. My spouse has been pressuring me, and she said she was going to divorce me if I didn't start coming to church. So I got baptized, or I prayed and accepted Christ. Like, what, that's not what I'm talking about. That, that's not sensing a need for the living water. No, has there ever been a point at which you saw your need for Jesus? Has there ever been a point in your life where you were thirsty and your spiritual eyes were open to your need for something more? Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a song from that great missionary, John Meyer, or Mayer, however you say his name. You got you to Google the lyrics to his songs because you can't understand what that brother's saying when he sings it, if you know what I'm talking about. But John Mayer has a song uh, called Something's Missing. And I think he describes this thirst that we experience very well. He says it this way. He says, I'm dizzy from the shopping mall. I searched for joy, but I bought it all. It doesn't help the hunger pains and a thirst I'd have to drown first to ever satiate. And in the chorus, he says over and over, something's missing and I don't know how to fix it. Something's missing and I don't know what it is. See, I think what he is describing there is this thirst. It's our eyes being opened that there's got to be something more than what we're experiencing in this life. Has that ever happened for you? 
Has there ever been a point in your life where you saw yourself in need of something else? Has there been a point in your life where you realized you were thirsty and wanted something more? Listen to me. If you've never experienced that thirst for something more, you might be a lot like the people at the festival here where Jesus is at. you got a whole lot of tradition and a whole lot of religion, but you may not have a faith, a true trust in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says the first requirement to getting living water is you have to be thirsty. So have you ever been thirsty today? Ask yourself that question and answer it. But see, then once you're thirsty, you have to do something, okay, he says. He says, let all who are thirsty come and drink. And so my second question for you this morning is this. Have you taken a drink of the living water? Have you taken a drink of the living water of Jesus Christ? You see, once you realize you are thirsty, right, You've got to do something about it. Now, there are some different angles people take once they sense this thirst in them. Once God opens their eyes and shows them that there's something missing, you have usually one of two options for most people, okay? The first option people run to is rebellion. Okay, everyone say rebellion. Okay, we can do better than that. I know you guys, you're more rebellious than that. Say rebellion. Rebellion. That's better, that's better, okay? Rebellion is the first way that we reject the living water of Jesus, okay? Rebellion is where we run. We try to quench our thirst with rebellious activity. This is the sex, drugs, and rock and roll approach, okay? This is, this is uh, it says, I'll try to satisfy this thirst I'm feeling with anything out there that I can find. I'm going to look everywhere to find whatever I can to fill this void that I'm sensing. I'll find what I need in the world on my own. I don't need Jesus, the living water. Jesus, you can't tell me what to do. Who are you to tell me how to live my life? Jesus, who are you to tell me what to do with my money? Jesus, who are you to tell me who I can sleep with? Okay? This is the sex, drugs, rock and roll, rebellious approach. Okay? This is us trying to fill and satisfy and quench the thirst in our own strength out in the world. This is the story of the woman at the well. I know we keep referencing her. She keeps coming back up because it's such a powerful story. Okay? This is what the woman at the well did. She was, she was thirsty and she sensed this void. And what did she do? She tried to fill it with sex with various uh, sexual partners and lovers and tried to find that fulfillment in that. Tried to quench her thirst in that. And then she has this interaction with Jesus. And Jesus says, look, that water that you've been trying to run to, those men, they will never satisfy you. They'll never quench your thirst the way I can. And he says, I want you to have the living water that I'm offering you. And if you'll take a drink of this, you will never thirst again. Amen? Thank the Lord she does in that story. See, rebellion is that first approach. It's, I'll go get what I want out in the world. I'll get my my, uh, fulfillment and my thirst quenched out in the world. But it's a rejection of God, right? The other option, and this is more specific to the text here, the other option, the other avenue we run to whenever we feel that thirst and sense that thirst is religion. Everyone say religion. Okay? You see, here Jesus in John 7 is talking to religious people. Okay? These people have come from miles and miles around to celebrate this religious festival, this tradition and this festival. And the religious people here had their uh, traditions and they were going to find what they needed in them. Religion says, I'll find what I need in myself. Rebellion says, I'll find what I need out in the world. Religion says, I'll find what I need in myself, making myself better. Uh, I'll find what I need in my ability to keep the rules and keep the law and look right and act right and talk right, right? I'll become a better version of myself. But religion is the same rejection of God as rebellion. Religion says, I'll make myself good enough to quench my thirst and I'll make myself good enough to get into heaven. To which I would ask you this question. How good is good enough? How good is good enough? Like, how do you know? Like, you're better than your brother, but like, everybody is. You know what I mean? Like, you may be better than that guy you work with, but like, everybody is. What what, what is that? Like, is is like 51% good enough to get you in? Is 90% good enough? What what is it? Because like, if my kid brings home a report card in a couple days as they round out the school year, and my my daughter has a 51% in math, that's not good, is it? Not good enough. So you would think at least if this whole good enough idea was what got you in and quenched your thirst, that God would at least occasionally give you like a progress report, right? Like he'd write it in the clouds or he'd speak to you while you were sleeping and be like, okay, you really got to shape up here. You don't have a lot of time left, right? So how is it that we know? Like what is it that it's his grading scale? Because I'm going to tell you, listen, some of you don't have enough time left in the semester. You know what I'm saying? To make up for what you have done or have not done. You remember those days, don't you, back in college, right? 
College is fun. You're hanging out with friends, staying up late, doing all the things you couldn't do when you were home, some of the things you shouldn't have been doing either at home or at college. You guys know who you are, okay? But you're partying, living it up. College is wonderful. And then midterms roll around, and you're like, oh, no. I am failing biology, and not like a little bit, like a lot, okay? And you think to yourself, all I have to do, oh, man, all I have to do is get 176 on the final exam to pass, and I can still pass. What in the world am I going to do, right? Now, college students today would just like go to the professor and be like, I feel bad about my self-esteem. I need a pass. I need a safe space. And they'd let you off of it, all right? I get that. We had to take the F in our day, okay? That's just how it worked, all right? Here's the thing, though. Some of you would admit that's where you are. You say, Brian, you're, Pastor, you're right. There is, like, I, I, I know the things that I've done. I know the way that I've lived my life, and there is not enough time to make up for all the wrongdoings that I do. There's no way I can make myself good enough. And some of you would admit that. But listen, the truth is, every single one of us falls into those shoes. Not a single one of us has enough time left in this semester to be good enough to get ourselves into heaven. Because here's the thing. Good people don't get into heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Are you all with me? See, because you have to be perfect. God's standard is perfection. God's standard is Jesus. And I'm telling you, I don't care if you're better than your brother or your coworker or your neighbor. You will never be as good as Jesus. This is why Jesus Christ went to a cross. And he hung there and he suffered and died as the perfect sacrifice so that we could receive him by faith, believing in him. This is what he's getting at with these people. We receive that living water. And when we do, the scriptures tell us that when God looks at us, he no longer sees us and our sin and our shortcomings and our 51% in English or math. But he sees 100% because when he looks at us, he sees Jesus Christ and his blood covering us. That's a great place to say amen if you were wondering. That's what Jesus offers us. It requires perfection for us to be able to get into heaven. It requires perfection for us to have this thirst quenched as he is talking about. See, religion foolishly says, I can do it on my own. Rebellion says, I'll go find it out in the world on my own. But really, they're both the same thing. You see, you can write this down if you'd like to. It's a great way to think about it. Rebellion is defiance against God. Religion is compliance with God, trying to make ourselves better, right? But neither one of them is a true reliance on Jesus living water. Neither one of them is a true reliance. And Jesus stands up in the midst of this crowd on this day and he says, look, you must believe in me in order to have this living water. You're never going to find it in your traditions. You're never going to find it in your festivals. You're never going to find it in your religious rituals. You'll never find it out in the world. You can only find it in me. So today, have you taken a drink from the fountain of living water? Are you drinking, trying to drink from other wells today? Other other fountains that you've been running to, whether that be religion or rebellion. The only way that we can quench the thirst in our souls is by taking a drink of the living water. And I'll add this part too. You can only take a drink of the living water for yourself. Listen to me. You can't borrow the faith of your parents or your grandparents or your spouse. I'm going to say it again. You can't borrow the faith of your parents or your grandparents or your spouse. You get no credit for what others around you have done. You must decide to drink it for yourself and receive Christ for yourself. It must be a personal faith to take a drink from the fountain of living water that Jesus offers. You get no credit for your parents. It's great. They've been members here for like 50 years. Wonderful. It has no bearing on your decision. It must be a personal decision. It doesn't matter if your grandparents built this church. It has no bearing upon whether you've taken of the and received the living water. It's a personal decision. It doesn't get handed down to you, right? It's not genetic. It doesn't come in your bloodline. It comes when you trust and you you take a drink of the living water that Jesus offers on your own. But here is the sad reality that I've seen over the years when it comes to the church. And a lot of the people in the story were the same way. The sad reality is you can be near the fountain of living water. You can be near it. You can understand the fountain. You can like the fountain. You can be related to people that have drank from the fountain. And yet never have taken a drink for yourself from the fountain of living water. How sad would that be that you would sit under the teaching of God's word and maybe even be raised in a family that loved Jesus and yet you've never truly placed your personal faith in Jesus and taken a drink from the fountain of living water. Jesus stands up in the middle of this scene. The people that were really tied to their tradition and he says, look, trust in me. Believe in me. And when you do, rivers of living water will flow from within you. But then John continues, 
He explains a little bit of what the living water does in us, which I think is the third question we've got to ask ourselves when we come to this idea of do we have tradition or do we have real trust in Jesus. Look at what verse 39 says. Verse 39 says, by this, he's talking about the, the rivers of living water flowing from within you. That's, that's, the, that's the phrase Jesus used. John's explaining this. He says, by this, this river of living water, he meant the spirit. Everyone say spirit. spirit. Whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here, okay? The Holy Spirit was promised to be given to every believer after Jesus was glorified, or once Jesus was glorified and ascended back into heaven to the right hand of the Father, okay? And we know from the book of Acts that Luke gives us, Luke wrote the book of Acts, that this happened just like Jesus promised on the day of Pentecost. Now, you might have heard that word thrown around once in a while at church if you've ever been to church. Okay, Pentecost, actually, it was another one of the three key festivals, just like the Feast of Booths that everyone's at here, okay? Pentecost is one of the other times of year when they got together traditionally for their festivals, okay? At Pentecost, a group of believers were gathered together in a room, and, and, and Acts lays this all out for us. Don't turn there. You can study it later. But they're in this room on the day of Pentecost, and they heard a mighty rushing wind from heaven blow through. Y'all know anything about wind around here? I make that joke every time the word wind comes up in scripture, but it's funny every time, isn't it? I told you if you laugh, we'll get out of here faster, but just, you know, just throwing that out there. They heard this mighty rushing wind blow through. Now, if you do some studying in the Old Testament, wind in the Old Testament is representative of God's power, and it also represents new life. Okay, think back to Genesis, when, when God breathes into Adam the breath of life. So that the Holy Spirit here, the, it's representative of God's power the God of heaven's power, and of new life that he wants in you. So the Holy Spirit is to give us power and new life. At Pentecost on that day, while they're in that room together, they also saw fire, flames of fire above the people that were present, which is really strange, okay? Fire in the Old Testament, if you study it out, represents the presence of God, okay? Think about Moses at the burning bush. How did God appear to him? He appeared to him in the flame of fire, right? And the, the bush was burning, but it never was consumed, okay? The Holy Spirit represents God's presence, the God of the universe's presence, okay? It also represents purification. The fire was refining. It was to purify. And again, in the same way with the Holy Spirit, it's that way. So the Holy Spirit is God's presence in us and the way he produces holiness and purity in us. And Acts tells us, if you were to read it, Acts tells us at that moment, when they hear this mighty rushing wind and they see the fire, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit indwells every believer from that day forward. That's the Holy Spirit today that lives inside of you, that lives within you if you have trusted Jesus Christ and believed in him and received and taken a drink of that living water. Y'all with me so far? This is the Holy Spirit he's talking about. And Jesus says, those that believe, that will lay down their traditions, will have the Holy Spirit of the living God living in them and flowing from within them. And so here's my third question today as we kind of start to wind down. That will tell you whether you've truly trusted Jesus or if all you have is tradition in church. Here's the third question. Is water flowing from within you, like Jesus describes here? Is water flowing from within you? What I mean by that is... Is the Holy Spirit working inside of you and flowing out of you? Do you see any changes in that regard? Because you see, listen to me, if you have the Holy Spirit, the God, which is the God of the universe, living inside of you, you should see and you should feel some changes in your life. There's no way around it. You should see some changes, some drastic changes in your life. Uh, Tim Keller explains it this way. He says, if you were to let an, imagine if you let an elephant loose in your house, okay? Some of you are like, I'm, I'm a mother. I have three kids. They're like elephants sometimes. I get it. We've got three and two dogs now, okay? But imagine if before you left for church today, you let a elephant, an actual elephant loose in your house. And I don't mean like a sweet little Dumbo type. I mean like the giant kind, right? When you got home today, would you know it had been there? Not a trick question. Yes or no? Like, like the sheer size and enormity of the object, right, of that elephant would completely restructure and probably demolish your house. There is no way anyone in their right sane mind could walk into your house after church, after a wild elephant has been let loose for two or three hours. They could not walk in and say, you know, I can't tell it's been here. Y'all are just messy anyway. I can't tell, I can't tell it's been here, right? Listen to me. If the Holy Spirit... 
the God of the universe is dwelling in you, should there not be some noticeable changes on the outside of your life? Yes or no? See, there ought to be some kind of reshaping and some kind of change. If you look just like your lost buddies or your lost co-workers and nothing about your life has changed or become new, you may want to check up. Because Jesus says that those who will come to me, the living water, and they will believe in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. There will be some noticeable changes in your life. It is inevitable. There should be some changes on the inside of us that then flow from within and make your life look differently on the outside. Now listen to me. We don't have time to do a deep dive on the Holy Spirit in, on, uh, in this message specifically. But I do want to ask you this question, and I've got a couple follow-ups to it. D do you ever see the Holy Spirit or sense the Holy Spirit at work in your life? You think about yourself. Do you ever sense or see the Holy Spirit at work in your life? That's what Jesus is talking about here and what John is describing for us. Listen, do you ever sense the Spirit guiding you or prompting you in decisions that you make? Do you ever sense Him prompting you? Do you ever sense Him guiding you? You should. If He's living inside of you, you should sense that and it should be lived out. And that river of living water should be flowing from within you to outside of you. Listen, do you ever feel the Spirit empower you to do something or say something or, or endure something that you couldn't have otherwise done on your own? Think about it in your life. If you have something as big as God living inside of you, it ought to start doing some changing in your life. It ought to change the way we see life. It ought to change the way we live. It ought to change the way we parent and the way we do marriage and the way we do work. And every piece of our lives should be shaped and changed by the Holy Spirit of God if He is indwelling you. Listen, there's another good one. Have your affections changed at all? I'm not saying do you ever, like, do you never desire to do wrong things? We all do. We're sinners saved by grace, and we have this wicked flesh to deal with until Jesus comes back to take us home. I'm not saying that, like, oh, if you ever sin or mess up that you're not. But listen, have your affections and your desires changed at all? The Scriptures tell us that, that when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells us, that we can obey what Psalms tells us. That we delight ourselves in the Lord and he gives us the desires of our heart. That doesn't mean if you like serve Jesus and go to church that he'll give you that Corvette you've been wanting. That's not what that means. It means that as you follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins to change your affections and your desires to be like Christ. Like, do you have the same affections that you had before you got saved or jumped in a baptistry? And again, I'm not saying once in a while. It, it's going to happen. But it's the pattern of your life that your affections look just like the lost person that you live down the street from or the lost person that you work with. Do you love the things that the world loves? Do you worship the things that the world worships? That's not evidence of someone with the Holy Spirit of God living inside them. Y'all with me? Say yes. Let me, I'll give you another good one. Do you desire to share Jesus with people at all? I'm not saying like every day you got to get up and like put your big grand, like your grandfather Bible under your arm and go running into work and like start preaching to people and wagging your I'm not saying that, okay? I'm not saying you've got to be a preacher or a pastor of sorts that can get up on a stage and like share, share faith with people. I'm not saying that at all. But do you have any desire to reach lost people at all? I think that's actually one of the best indicators right there that the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. If it never crosses your mind to reach lost people... I love you enough to be honest with you. You probably don't know the Jesus that we're talking about here in John 7. See, we've been talking, I told the first service this. We've been talking for the last year and a half specifically about this question. Who's your one? Who is your one you're trying to reach? And again, I'm not saying you got to like be a master at sharing your faith and whatever. And you got to, you know exactly the right things and the right arguments to give them to like get them to their knees by the end of that conversation. That is not what I'm saying at all. But if you don't have a one in your life at this point, after a year and a half of hearing that, boy, I would, I would encourage you to do some major checking up on your soul. Because more than likely, you've not taken a drink of the living water that Jesus offers. There is something the Holy Spirit does in us as believers that when we come to Christ, that we want to share that new life with others because we care about other people. And we stop seeing the people around us as things that can help us get ahead and objects that can help us have a better life. And we start seeing them through the lens that Jesus sees them as people that are lost, like that lost sheep in the parable in Luke, that the shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. If you, I'm telling you, 
If you got no desire to see anyone else come to Jesus Christ, you should do some major checking up on your soul right now. Let me give you another one. The last one. Do you ever feel convicted about your sin? I didn't say, do you ever feel bad when you get caught? That's what our culture does. They just go about their merry way sinning and doing whatever the heck they want to do. And then the moment they get caught, they say some junk line like, oh, that's not the real me. Yes, it is the real you. That's not an apology to get up and say, I'm sorry, that's not the real me. You're copping out. That is the real you. Do you ever personally feel convicted about your sin? I think a great way to think about it is this. If you knew you could do something that was wrong and get away with it and no one would ever know, would you do it? Think about it. If you knew you could do something that you knew was wrong and you could get away with it and nobody would ever know differently, would you do it? And I'm not saying this never happens because we all do this from time to time, right? But what I'm asking you, is that the pattern of your life? That in your life, you go through life doing whatever you can, and as long as you don't get caught, you are happy, and everything is hunky-dory, and you are great, right? Is that the pattern of your life? That's not indicative of someone that has the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in them and flowing from within them. Y'all with me? And then I'd say the second piece of that is when you do that and you go through with that, because again, even your pastor does that sometimes. Y'all all do it. Okay, don't look at me all pious. I know you do, right? When you do that, and you've gotten away with it, do you feel convicted or feel bad about it afterwards? The Holy Spirit of God ought to be beating you up on the inside before you ever get caught on the outside, right? That's the Holy Spirit of God. That's that purification piece I was telling you about earlier. This is how God makes us holy and sanctifies us as we walk through life by way of the Holy Spirit prompting us on the inside, even when no one would know differently on the outside. You'd never get caught by anybody. The Holy Spirit of God ought to beat you up over some of the things that you're doing right now. Is he? You know, I was thinking about this. I wrote this message a couple weeks ago, and I try to stay a few weeks out in advance of, of the sermons. And as I was writing this, uh, I was thinking back to the previous week, and uh, I was out shopping uh, with my, my wife, and I suggested that we go to TJ Maxx. That was mistake number one, okay? And I always regret it. You always spend too much, and you just find things like you're like, oh, I didn't know I needed that until I saw it. Didn't know I needed that strainer made out of acacia wood. I didn't know I needed that, you know? But you see it, and you buy it, right? We were out there, and we, uh, we shopped till we dropped, as we often do in TJ Maxx, and then we, we, had, we had a cart full, one of those carts, shopping carts, and we rolled back out to our car, and we start unloading, and uh, as we were unloading, I realized, man, we actually had to park on the far end of the parking lot. Like, we were all the way on the opposite end from the store, from the actual building itself, because it was so crowded. It was like a Friday or Saturday or something. I think it was actually prom weekend, if I remember right. We had to park all the way at the other end, and there were no cart corrals, Okay. Which, by the way, if anyone in here works for TJ Maxx, get some stinking cart corrals, all right? You will keep your pastor from sinning. You just will, all right? Get some cart corrals, all right? That's a side, that's a side story. But no, we know in that situation the right thing to do, don't we? We know the right thing to do. We know the right thing is that when we finish with the shopping cart out in the parking lot, no matter if we're like 10 feet or 10 miles from the store, that we should take that shopping cart and we should walk it back into the store and put it back for the next person, right? Everyone agree to that? Yes? We all know that's the right thing to do. I didn't want to do it, right? Y'all ever, ever been there? And so as I'm unloading our cart, I start to close the, 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 the trunk of our, of our, uh, of our car and, and I'm thinking of where I'm going to put this thing and, and, the, and I'm planning where I'm going to leave it and the Holy Spirit goes... You need to take that cart back inside. And I said, no, I don't want to. And he says, Brian, you need to take that cart back inside and put it back in the store. And I said, it's not that big of a deal, Holy Spirit. And he said, Brian, you need to take that cart back inside. And I said, Holy Spirit, it's not killing anybody, right? Remember that argument from last week? If that's your litmus test for life, you're going to do some bad things in life if that's your litmus test. It didn't kill anybody, right? But I said it, you know, you, do, you have this conversation trying to justify your sin. Like, I, I, it's not killing anybody, Holy Spirit. And he, said, and he goes, he goes, Pastor Brian, he said, didn't you just write a sermon this week? It talked about living under God's authority in the big things and the small things. And I was like, no, that was Pastor Chad. Leave me alone. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I kind of dropped my head like your kids do when you catch them in the act. And I was like, yeah, that was me. Was like, I get it. I know I should obey. He said, you need to take that shopping cart and put it back inside. Do you know what I did? I said, leave me alone. And I shoved it into the Buick next to me, and I hopped in the car, and I went home, right? <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I, I, I took the five-minute walk back into the building, and I took the shopping cart back inside. 
Now listen, that is a funny story. And I'm telling you this morning, I am nobody special or ultra hyper spiritual. I am a sinner saved by grace, just like the other believers in this room and the other believers joining us online. But listen to me. I can't count the number of times in my life since I've become a Christian that the Holy Spirit has done just that about some issue in my life. See, that was a simple little thing. And I could have gotten away with it and nobody would have known. And there have been other points in my life where I could have gotten away with things and no one would have known. And, and I feel a tug on the inside. And the Holy Spirit says, you know what, Brian, you don't need to do that. I'm a, I'm a, Brian, I'm going to stop you right there. And he's a perfect gentleman, if you will. But there's a tug on the inside. Listen, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus is talking about. If you will believe in me, rivers of living water will flow from within you. Does that kind of water ever flow from within you? If it doesn't, you probably don't know Jesus. And you're a lot like these people here at this festival. You have a whole lot of tradition, but you don't have a true, genuine trust in Jesus Christ. If you are with me, say yes. See, the work of the Holy Spirit, the living water, should be flowing from within and changing us to be more like Jesus. Then look at verse 40. We'll wrap this up. Verse 40. On hearing his words, some of the people that were there said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said he's the Messiah. Still others said, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? They knew he was supposed to come from Bethlehem, right? Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants? There's Bethlehem, okay? And from Bethlehem, uh, the town where David lived. Go ahead to the next one for me. Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. So they're still debating, just as they've been throughout this whole chapter. Some wanted to seize him. They were mad about what he was saying. But no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards. Okay, remember who they were from two weeks ago? Temple guards were like the temple police. The Pharisees heard whisperings about Jesus there at the festival. And they said, hey, temple guards, go take care of this guy and bring him in. That's what they told him. This is the back end of the story. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and to the Pharisees who had sent them out, who asked them, well, why didn't you bring Jesus in? Why didn't you bring him in? I love the temple guards' response. No one ever spoke the way this man spoke. We've never seen anything like it, Pharisees. I mean, we know our job. We're the temple police. We know what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take instructions from you guys, and we're supposed to go carry them out. But we went to carry it out, and something happened when we talked to this Jesus. He spoke in a way that we've never heard before, and it threw us off our game, and we don't even know what to do with it. And we, we aren't told here that they believe necessarily at this point, but there was something about Jesus that was almost magnetic to them because they left him be and didn't bring him in to the Pharisees. <laughs> Look what the Pharisees say. You mean he has deceived you too? You mean he's pulled the wool over your eyes? The Pharisees retorted, verse 48, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? Basically, they're saying, we haven't given you the stamp of approval on this Jesus guy to believe. We've not believed, so you cannot believe. Okay, just, just using their spiritual authority to, to beat people down is what they're doing. No, they said, the Pharisees, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Talking about the big group of people, that, they're, that they've been duped, right? They've been uh, hypnotized, if you will, okay, by Jesus. Verse 50, Nicodemus, same guy we met in chapter 3 who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number. He was one of the Pharisees, right? Uh, he asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? This was like a condescending thing. Galilee was thought of as like a redneck town. They're like, are you one of the rednecks too that doesn't know anything about the law? He says, look into it and you'll see. You'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. And again, they try to flex their religious spiritual authority muscles over who is there present to keep them from believing in Jesus. And so what I see as we kind of wrap this up, the religious leaders had their traditions and what they do here is they double down and they lean harder into their traditions. They encounter Jesus who offers them this living water that is far better than any of their rituals or traditions. And instead of believing in Jesus and following him and taking of the living water, they lean harder into their traditions. And yet, the temple police that are there, the brutes that are there, they, they function differently here, didn't they? Instead of leaning harder into the traditions and doing exactly what the Pharisees had told them, they at some level here, whether they believed or not, they leaned into Jesus because they saw something in Jesus they had never seen or heard before. And that's saying something because those temple guards would have been around the Pharisees and heard them teach and heard the things that they did and seen the way that they lived. They said there was something about this Jesus 
And so you've got two responses here at the end of this chapter as it ends. You've got the religious leaders who said, you know what? Our tradition is good enough for us. We're going to hang on to it. Forget you, Jesus. And then you've got the temple guards who are leaning into what Jesus has taught. And really, that's the two responses that we have today. As we close this chapter, as we close the, the scriptures, go ahead and close your Bibles. The two options today, according to the story, are this. You can lean into Jesus because you've heard something maybe today for the first time that's awakened something in your soul. Or you can grasp onto your traditions and stay just as you are in your sin. And so here, the question that I want to leave you with today as we close is this. What do you have today, tradition or trust? What do you personally have today, tradition or trust? Those are the two options on the table. Again, I don't care if your grandparents built this church. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you felt that thirst on the inside that can't be quenched with anything else? And have you come to Jesus for a drink of the living water by believing? Listen, I'll tell you this. This is so powerful. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the Father. Jesus says, nobody will come into me unless the Father draws them. Can I tell you this? If, you've been, if your soul's been awakened to your emptiness and that something is missing, listen to me, that is God the Father drawing you right now. You realize that? The God of the universe loves you enough to draw him, draw you to himself. But it's up to you to believe and take a drink. Listen, it is not too late. The fact that you are sitting here today under the sound of my voice, it is not too late to believe. Take a drink. I don't care if you've been coming here for 20 years. If you've never taken a drink, take a drink today and believe. Because I'm going to tell you, what Jesus stood up in their midst and did in the story today, he stood up tall over tradition and religion, and he offered them something altogether better, altogether new, altogether different. He says, I have the living water, and I am the living water that you've been looking for. See, he stood up in this story, and he said that, and I would tell you today, Jesus stands in our midst and he's calling you lay down your rebellion lay down your religion whatever it is you've been trying to quench your thirst with and all that are thirsty come to me drink of the living water see his offer is the same for us today his offer hasn't changed but his offer can change your life forever amen listen to me if you haven't believed today make this the best mother's day you'll ever celebrate believe the scriptures have made it so simple you know when we began this whole series we talked about John's purpose in writing the book he said his purpose in writing the book is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God have you done that John 3 16 tells us that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him perish, but will have everlasting life. That's all you got to do. you got to believe. Look, there are no catechisms you have to memorize. There's no confessionals you have to go to. There's no Hail Marys you have to pray to get you in. Jesus says, believe. 